Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ralph Izzo. Thank you, Oliver. To truly grasp the future of energy, you want us to spend a little bit of the time in the past. So if you will, just journey back with me about three plus years to October 28th, 2012. It was about 6 p.m. I was sitting in our emergency response center talking to our head of utility operations. We had spent the better part of the last three or four days studying every report from every weather forecast that we can get our hands on learning the names of all these different complicated models that were predicting the path of a storm that started in the Caribbean and was making its way up north. Most of the models predicted a north to northeasterly pattern for the storm, but there was one model, the so-called European model, that said there was a distinct chance that this storm was going to run into a unique, unique set of conditions and make a sharp turn west, right around the middle of New Jersey. Fortunately, it was the minority point of view, and at 6 p.m. that night on October 28th, I turned to my colleague and I said, well, I guess we dodged that bullet. Everything seems fine. A lot of rain, a fair amount of wind, but nothing we hadn't experienced before. Well, the next hour would prove that statement to be one of the most ridiculously wrong statements I'd ever made in my life. And thus was born Superstorm Sandy. The amount of destruction that we realized was the worst that we had ever had in the 109-year history of our company. And while the damage that resulted in 90% of our 2 million customers being without power was a unique experience, what we learned about customer behavior and customer patterns in the next two weeks really had the longer term effect on the future of energy. Within 12 hours of the storm hitting, I was on the phone with a handful of other CEOs in similar conditions and the President of the United States. President Obama won't remember that conversation. I'll never forget it. He wanted to know when would we get this the city of Newark back? When would Newark Airport be functioning? What was going to happen to the refineries? And so on and so on. Within two days after that, I received a similar phone call from Air Force One, this time speaking to one of his security advisors. The president was on his way to New Jersey and wanted to know what kind of progress we had made. Every day for the next two weeks, I was talking either to the Secretary of Energy or the Deputy Secretary of Energy. My head of utility operations was on the phone every day talking to the governor of New Jersey. But perhaps the most poignant conversation that took place was about 48 or 72 hours after the storm has hit, once again sitting in the emergency control room, and the cell phone of my colleague buzzed, colleague buzzed. And he looked at it, and it was the, the identification said it was a local hospital in Newark, New Jersey. So he picked up the phone and asked who he was speaking with, and it turned out to be a heart surgeon who he did not know. And this surgeon wanted to know whether or not he would have power back in his hospital that day because he had been hearing and reading that we were focused on restoring critical loads, and yet their hospital was still on backup power. And in the absence of, and in the absence of reliable service from the grid, he didn't know whether or not he should go ahead with these surgeries. Of course, we promised to get his electricity back, and sure enough, that day we did. And he was able to conduct those two operations. A slightly less poignant communication took place for me within 10 days of the storm. At that point, I received an email, a rather eloquently written email, from a parent who said, look, I understand the damage. I've been listening to all the news reports. I know you are up to your eyeballs in work. But if you don't get my power back today, I am sending my teenager to live with you. <laughs> you know, I've told that story for three years. I was a little worried about telling that story in this audience, but nonetheless, I'm glad I did. The moral of the story is nothing more than the fact that we rely on electricity in so many different ways. The average home has 25 different devices connected to their electric supply. It's everything from our television to our computers to our toothbrushes. And it is no longer sufficient to have electricity delivered to the home on beautiful, bright, sunny days like today. Now electricity has to be delivered to that home reliably, even in the face of a superstorm, Sandy. Let's take a slightly longer journey back in time over the past three, four, maybe five decades, we've seen steady improvement in our protection of the environment. Without question, the American citizen wants to see their environment protected, their air, their water, their land. Now, I believe Petty requires that all freshmen take chemistry. So if I'm not mistaken, everyone in this room has had some exposure to chemistry. So in the early days of powering our economy, what we relied on most heavily were hydrocarbons. These were fabulous fuels. They were abundant. They were inexpensive. They easily combusted to produce, uh, uh, to produce uh, additional energy in the form of heat. 
And the cheapest and most available of all hydrocarbons was coal. The only problem with coal is it contained more than just hydrogen and carbon. It seems to contain every element in the periodic tables. So when it is burned, it produces a lot of nasty stuff that one doesn't want. So over the years, we got a lot better at scrubbing the coal and cleaning the pollutants that came out from that combustion process. And then we began to realize that, you know, there's something that's even cleaner than coal that's a hydrocarbon. Let's start burning natural gas. And we put that word natural in front of the word yes, just so everybody feels better. But in that case, too, that combustion process takes place in the presence of air. And air is not just oxygen. Air contains nitrogen as well. And we found that some of the byproducts of that combustion were things called nitrous oxides, precursors to ozone, which is not good stuff to breathe, especially on a hot, sticky summer day. So we've made improvements with these hydrocarbons. We've scrubbed out the sulfur dioxide. We've scrubbed out the, the carcinogenic compounds that might be emitted as a result of incomplete combustion. But if you, if you remember your basic chemistry, if I am going to burn a hydrocarbon in the presence of oxygen, complete combustion, and if you will, allow me to call complete combustion perfect combustion, would yield two outcomes, water and carbon dioxide. That was nirvana. That's what we had to strive for. And so lo and behold, some NASA scientists and some NOAA scientists reminded us that that is not so perfect after all. And in fact, carbon dioxide, that pleasant little compound that you have in your carbonated beverages, is actually changing the entire ecosystem of our planet. And with the continued production of carbon dioxide, even in a perfect hydrocarbon reaction, what we find is that we are changing uh, our, our planet in ways that are irreversible. So the future in an environmentally sensitive and environmentally protective world is one that is more dependent on carbon-free sources of energy. Uh, for most of the world, that will be nuclear power, but increasingly that's going to be solar power. Over 20% of the electricity in the United States is produced by nuclear energy, and an increasing amount is produced by solar and wind. In the mid-Atlantic, the dependency is more on solar than it would be on wind. My favorite form of carbon-free energy is what I call a megawatt, and that's energy efficiency. That's getting the same amount of lighting, the same amount of comfort, the same amount of whatever desired output one is pursuing through devices that use less electricity. So the third and final anecdote that I'll share with you about what's driving us towards a different energy future is much more recent. It's one in which um, involves surveys that we do with our customers on a regular basis. And once a quarter, I get summaries of those surveys. And we ask our customers all kinds of questions, and I won't bore you with the details. But we end every survey with one open-ended question. And the question is simply this. Other than lower your rates, other than lower your rates, what is the single most important thing that PSEG can do for you? Now, typically, when the lights aren't blinding and I can see the audience, I can ask people to volunteer answers. But I won't do that here. I'll simply say that, well, many of you are probably thinking, well, they must ask for more reliable electricity, right? Wasn't that the whole moral of the first story? And if you guessed that, you would find that that answer tends to show up second or third in the open-ended question. So again, we ask, other than lower your rates, what's the most important thing PSEG can do for you? You say, well, then it's obvious. It must be produce electricity in a way that's cleaner so it doesn't damage the environment. That was the second story I gave. And if that was your answer, you'd be right partially because that shows up to be number two or number three as well. So other than lower your rates, what is the most important thing PSG can do for you? The number one answer consistently is lower my rates. <laughs> so a cynic could interpret that to be some sort of reading comprehension difficulty on the part of a few million customers. And my life would be very easy if I could walk away with that interpretation. But sadly, that is not the interpretation. The real interpretation is lowering the rates is so important that don't tell me to not remind you of the need to do that. So how does one lower rates and I thought that was deleted, but it wasn't, so we just skipped right over it. Other than, so how does one make sure that people pay less for their electricity while making it cleaner and more reliable than ever before? And the answer is really technology. It's technology that creates a hierarchy of things that we will have to do. First and foremost, it begins with energy efficiency, devices that simply use less energy to do the same thing we always wanted them to do. Secondly, it's making sure that the electricity that's supplied comes from cleaner and cleaner sources, wind, solar, nuclear, from a carbon-free point of view. 
Third, it's making sure that the grid is smarter than it's ever been before and more resilient than it's ever been before. That's solid state physics, that's having large data acquisition so that we can tell where problems are before they even take place because of signal processing capability that tells us that something is going on on a wire that wasn't taking place before. And then making sure that that electricity, that clean electricity, that reduced amount of electricity is there for people every minute and every second that they uh, want to make use of it. Thank you for your time and attention.